All right. Yep. You're ready. Yeah. The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on the link on the town's webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, and Article 10 of the Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call vote of the roll call of the members of the ZBA impaneled for this meeting tonight. I'm Steve Judge. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. And uh, we have two associate members sitting in um, and they paneled for tonight's meeting. Mr. Barrick? Here. And Mr. Meadows? Here. Also in attendance is Marine Pollock Planner and Dave Washevitz, Building Inspector. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for, to gain additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public comp input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by, raising, by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and the input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits. The board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, ZBA FY 2021-15, Mark Soulfield, renewal of special permit ZBA FY 2018-26 for a flag lot under section 6.3 and section 10.33 of the zoning bylaw, located off Southeast Street, map 23D, parcel 57, outlying residence RO and aquifer recharge protection ARP zoning districts. ZBA 20. 21-16, Andrew and Sheila Jones request a special permit in order to allow the pre-existing non-conforming one family detached dwelling to be structurally altered and expanded into the required side yard setback by 13 feet, adding 237.9 square feet to the proposed house addition under section 
and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 297, or two, excuse me, 279 Amity Street. Map 14A, parcel six, neighborhood residence, RN zoning district. And ZBA FY 2021-17, College Street 1957 LLC. Request a special permit in order to allow the change of use from a one family detached dwelling to a non-owner occupied duplex dwelling. Extension and alteration of the lot coverage and building area on a pre-existing non-conforming lot. Modification of the re required additional lot area slash family under dimensional regulations footnote A, sections 3.211, 9.22 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 187 College Street Map 14B, parcel 169, General Residence RG Zoning District. Following those matters, there's, all, there's our general public comment period for matters not before the board tonight and any other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. The first order of business tonight is a public hearing on ZBA 2021-15, Mark Soulfield, Renewal of Special Permit ZBA FY 2018-26 for a flag lot under section 6.3, section 10.33 of the zoning bylaw, located off Southeast Street, map 23D, parcel 57, outlying residence RO and aquifer recharge protection ARP zoning districts. Are there any disclosures? We conducted site visits on May 26th and May 27th. Um, I can report on the site visit on the 27th. Um, it was, we arrived at the Mount Pollux parking area for the Mount Pollux conservation, walked to the property with the, uh, with the applicant. We viewed the site lines, uh, the lot lines, the sight lines from the property, heard a bit of the history of the property and um, viewed the other homes in the area as well as the views in the, uh, of the, from the property. Um, some went over to the far lot line to view that. Um, I came back to the car and um, that's pretty much, I think, it for the, the, the visit. There weren't a lot of questions asked which we need to um, look at, um, which we have to, to disclose tonight. Um, was there a lot, was there a, any additional information that people want to offer for the site visit for this property? Okay, good enough. Um, the following submissions have been received by town staff on this. The applicant has supplied ZBA uh, applications for ZBA FY 2021. Uh, bound, there's a boundary line agreement and subdivision approval, not required plan in Massachusetts, prepared by Mew, uh, Neil and Marie Christine L. Crago, prepared by Rand, Randall Iser, dated April 20th. Uh, previously approved special permit decision from 2018 and previously approved plans. The applicant's waiver requests are for a site plan waiver, building plan waiver, management plan, landscape plan, lighting plan, and sign plan waivers. Planning staff submissions include a zoning map, an aerial map, conservation and trails map, topography map, and a project application report dated May 20th, 2021. Are there any other, uh, since you prepared this project application report, Maureen, were there any other submissions to the Board of Town Government? Nothing? No. Okay. Um, Who's here to represent the applicant? Uh, we have Mark uh, Sofield himself. The applicant, <laughs> the applicant himself. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sofield, um, please state your name and address for the record. Mark Sofield, 1339 Southeast Street, Amherst. Great. Um, can you pr prepare, uh, present to the board your application and give me an idea of how much time you think you'll require to for your presentation? Uh, a minute, probably. <laughs> um, it's a request to renew a special permit that has been renewed every two years um, since my parents bought the land in 1974. Is um, fine, thank you. 
Are there questions from the board? The one question I have, uh, Mr. Sofield, is I know this has been uh, continued and, and uh, renewed seven or eight times, I think. Just give us some history on why it's, it's, it's been there and you haven't um, built anything on the lot, which uh -huh. is required after two years. You know? uh -huh. So my parents bought it with the intention of building a house there and uh, they got divorced before that could happen. Uh, my mother got the lot in the divorce settlement and she held on to it uh, as a legacy for her children, my, me and my sister and our um, three children. And uh, she passed uh, just a few months after the zoning, the last time this came up for, for the zoning hearing. And uh, it was in probate for a year. It's now out of probate, but we just haven't decided what, my sister and I and our children haven't decided what to do with the land at this point. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from board members? If not, um, Mr. Maxfield. Um, I don't know, just going through here, nothing nothing significantly has really changed in our, our zoning laws since the last two years, the last time this was renewed um, that I'm unaware of. Uh, has that been the case, uh, Mr. Chair? Because I, I think it came out about a year ago and there's been no major changes since then the last time uh, since I was on here. So there wouldn't have been any major changes to the zoning laws, correct? Not. I don't know. I'm not that I know of. I'm no. Not, no major changes. Okay, fantastic. Yep. Ms. Parks. Um, and I'm just looking at, I think it's page four where it talks about the aquifer recharge protection. And it was um, saying uh, the health department suggested that a condition be added um, for soil testing. And so I'm just wondering if those conditions that are on this page four would be a part of this uh, new permit. Um, you, see, you see where it says residue yep. from apple orchard. And so at the, at the last sentence there is that it suggested that a condition be added to mm -hmm. have the soil tested. Am I, am I assuming that these conditions that are here, because it's saying that Mr. Sofiel was asking to waive some of the original conditions and like at the bottom here, it says the board uh, did not waive condition one. So we can, there's uh, two, two parts to the answer to your question, okay. Ms. Parks. The first is we can decide on what uh, conditions we wish to impose um, in order to approve the special permit. Okay. Those can, I would um, think we should continue the, conditions that have been imposed in the past okay. and continue those. Um, and we can hear from the applicant if there is a concern about that. But um, that's the first thing. And so that would be part of our discussion on conditions. The second thing is I think that the, the project application report inaccurately talks about a waiver for condition one, that the, if you look at the condition that exists uh, po under possible con conditions of approval on page eight, the, dealing with the maximum height of the building, that is a condition that was that was adopted in 2000, 2018, I think was the last time. Um, and that was in, in, uh, modified from an earlier uh, condition. And I think this is a condition which was negotiated at the time with the applicant. So, and then on the, um, we can, I don't remember reading that there was concern on the um, condition five, I think, which is the one, where's the condition that deals with the um, drainage, not the drainage, but the um, former orchard and the, uh, the uh, a condition insecticides. Five. Is it condition five? Yep. Mm -hmm. Condition five was, was part of earlier approvals and I, I have not don't see that there has been an action a request to remove that 
but it was an orchard. It was, it is on, you know, a, a aquifer recharge area. We, we should make sure that there's, you know, if there, when, if and when a building permit is, is approved, we should make sure that the land is not leaching to the, that there's nothing leaching into the um, aquifer. So we can discuss those when we get to conditions. Yep. Any other questions or comments from board members? Maureen, do we have anybody from the, the public? Uh, we do. Um, so you are you saying that you're you're opening it up to public comment? Public comment, yeah. Sure. Um, sure. We have uh, Aaron Hayden. If you could state your name and your address. Hi there. This is uh, Aaron Hayden, fourteen ninety one. Hi, Mark. It's been a long time since uh, we've seen each other. Um, I am uh, one of the uh, the people who got the the letter because I, I do have uh, an interest that's. Um, being the uh, the parcel immediately to the east, um, among the conditions, I'm hopeful that you will uh, retain um, both the height restriction and also the setback from the ridge line. Um, there, there's a, a detail there that, that um, keeps the the building. It's a little bit further than the um, than the um, the setback is required. I believe it's 50 feet. Um, I have solar panels there uh, personally, and I would like to keep them unencumbered, but also just uh, generally um, keeping things away from the ridge lines, um, which are, and in this case, a ridge line, which is abutting a, a, a very popular park, um, I think is important. And uh, you know, among the four acres, there's lots of room to put some you know, very many beautiful views, as you know, because you've been there. Um, not opposed to building there at all, Mark. Happy to have, have a new neighbor, but I'm just hoping they can be a little bit down the hill. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comments? Maureen, do we have anybody? Uh, no, we don't. All right, this is an opportunity for Mr. Sofield to respond to um, any public comments or to any questions that the board, um, any questions the board had or anything you heard us say. Um, I have no, um, no questions or comment. All right. If there are no other questions from the board, um, I think we should move to um, a public meeting where we can discuss conditions um, and, uh, and findings that we have to make. I want to make sure that we keep the public hearing meeting open while we move to the public meeting portion. And we can close both once we finish um, this disposition of the matter before us. So I would entertain, entertain a motion to open a public meeting on this matter while keeping the public hearing open as well. Do I have a second or do I have a motion? So move. move. Second. Second. Uh, this is a roll call vote. All in favor say, um, uh, I'll say aye, <laughs> Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Barrett. Aye. So this is a time when we can discuss those findings and conditions uh, that uh, we have before us. Um, we have to do a couple of things here. Um, first off, we have to make um, some, we have to find for section six of the zoning bylaw dealing with flag lots. We then um, need to also make a finding on um, 6.37, which deals with um, driveway or the access strips, uh, which is in section seven. We have to look at the, the technology aquifer protection, and then we have 10.38. Uh, but before we go through all those, I'd like to look at conditions that were in, imposed in this application previously. And I, in review of those conditions, they all seem to make sense to me. And some were adjusted in the last, uh, the last um, um, application, last hearing 
to to accommodate requests from the applicant and the and it deal, deals with also number two deals with the question of the um, um, construction area being tested for arsenic because it was a that you raised Ms. Parks um, section 6.35 and 6.6.34 and 6.35 um, as a building area um, equal to 150 feet that will come in play when um, there's an actual building plan. Uh, the, the driveway and the drainage plan must be approved by the town and submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The aquifer recharge protection district restrictions found in section 3.254 of the bylaw shall be observed on the access pole section of the property. This includes, but is not limited to, a prohibition on the use of sodium chloride, fertilizers, pesticides, and other hazardous leachable materials. This permit, the condition six, has a two-year expiration period. That is all, all um, special permits do. And when there is a plan and there is construction, all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and dark sky, a dark sky compliant in compliance with ZBA rules and regulations. Those are the conditions that have applied before and I would recommend that we, we apply those conditions uh, to this um, react, I don't know, I guess it's the recertification of this application, renewal of this application. Are there any other, any comments on conditions, questions, concerns? Okay, um, I think the thing to do would be to Vote on these, vote on these, Mr. Meadows. Uh, the comment that Aaron Hayden mentioned about keeping it farther down on the, from the ridge line, I didn't notice anything in the prior conditions about that. Is it, did I just miss it or? Highest point for roof, reliance, deck of roof, average height. I thought he said it was in the, he understood it was in the previous special permit but I do not see it here. Maureen, would you know? Um, it, let's see, well, uh, we could read aloud. Uh, Steve, I don't know if, you, did you read aloud uh, condition one as written? I can read it again. Yep, I didn't read the whole thing. The maximum height of any, this deals with the height of the building, I think. I don't know if it deals with the setting. The maximum height of any building upon the land being conveyed shall not exceed 24 feet in height at the assumed benchmark elevation of 100 at station 306, which is in reference to a topographical plan of Amherst, Massachusetts, prepared for David Sofield by Elmer Hutley Jr. and Associates. So that's a point on the property, a specific point on the property from which to reference the height of the of the, um, the height of any building, I assume. Is that, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Mr. Sofield if that's correct. There's a specific point on the property that this references to, right? Exactly. Yep. Okay. The minimum or maximum height of the building shall be measured at the vertical distance from the average finished grade on the street side of the structure to the highest point on the roof flats, to the deck line for mansard roofs, and to the average height midpoint between the highest eaves and the ridge of the main body of the roost for gable, hip, shed, salt box, and gambrel roofs or combination thereof as defined by Amherst zoning bylaw. So uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I pulled up a yep. uh, previously approved uh, 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 plans uh, related to the flag lot. Um, and so um, when you repeat the condition, as you were repeating condition one, um, if Mr. Soulfield could indicate that specific point that was re referenced in condition one, that would be helpful. Yeah, I'm not sure it shows on this plan. What what does show, however, is the restricted building line that that Aaron was referring to. This this um, line right here, if you can yeah. see my mouse. Yep. So yeah, uh, which is further, which which pushes what would it be the typical setback further west? Mm -hmm. And the solar panels are perhaps in this sort of general area. Well, I. Presumably they're not. They're presumably uh -oh. they're not in the in. So on on the Hayden side of the line, there's also a restricted building line, and presumably the solar panels are um, east of that line. 
So is that actually? I, I don't. I don't actually know if that's if that's correct, but I hope so. But um, Mr. Sofield, again, um, we want to try to get the answer to this, so we're going to um, get your get your response. Restricted building line. You, this is the line to which Mr. Hayden was speaking, is it not? And would this also be then, is, Maureen, is this in reference? Would this be included by reference in the special permit? This drawing and this restricted building line? Yes. So this was a previously to, to approved. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, uh, the ZBA could be specific in citing this, um, you know, this plan sheet and you know yeah. you know who prepared it and the date um, the applicant did um, submit a uh, recently um, an a and r plan um, that's the, the the plan I just showed you before I think is from 1978 74 sorry um, so this one is a digitalized um, a, uh, a approval not required um, plan for let me make this larger if I can, um, for the flag lot. And let's see here. And so the this plan continues to show that restricted building line um, in question. Um, so, and I, I believe this is where Mr. Yeah. Hayden resides. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, okay, so we'll go back to, go back to that 74 map again, make sure that's the same. Yep, it looks to be the same line, mm -hmm. 74. Mm -hmm. Is that your understanding that it's the same line as 74, Mr. Sofield? Uh, yes. Okay, all right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Meadows. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, I'm not really certain. Um, what Mr. Hayden was saying was a certain distance from the ridge line not the restricted building line. And I, the ridge line, I would assume, is closer to the top of the map than it is to the bottom of the map indicated. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I can answer that if you'd like. Please. Yes. The, the, so the ridge line is to the bottom of the map. Yeah. Um, the, the topography rises page down. Um, and in fact, that station point referenced in uh, number one, it is shown, I'm seeing it now, it is shown on, on this 74 map elevation top of, of um, 100. Yeah, so that, it's referenced that, that in the general the, notes. It's yeah. referenced in the general notes. Number one, all grades shown are based yeah. on a, a assumed benchmark elevation of 100 at station 306. And um, mm -hmm. if you can see my mouse sort of yeah. swirling around, that's the mm -hmm. high top uh, top elevation of this of this hillside, and uh, which is at 100, which is outside of the property line, um, and, uh, and then it slopes down this way. Um, and then it continues to slope downwards this in this direction. So that if I if I understand the comment uh, that Aaron Hayden meant indicated, he said fifty feet from the ridge from the ridge line. And I'm I'm not positive if it, it's difficult to determine if this station three hundred six is is what he was asking or not? Well, it's, we know the ridge line extends to that where it says 106.5. Right. Um, this, the access is 40 feet wide mm -hmm. um, coming in, the access line with those, what it looks to be trees yep. in it. Yep, that's right 40 here. feet it, wide. Yep. The restricted, it's close to 40 feet just from the lot line. The restricted line is back about 40 feet from the lot line. And certainly it's, I think it, it's awfully close to 50 feet from the, the, the point and certainly 50 feet from the, the top of the ridge, 106.5. Mm -hmm. So it, 
I didn't hear him say that he wanted to change the exist, change what was there. I heard him say he wanted to maintain what was at the, uh, was in the old uh, uh, condition one. Um, well, if condition one, right. if, if interpreting them will, if this condition one it can be interpreted to suggest that it's, it meets the conditions that he was asking for, then, then that's fine. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Ms. Parks. Is it okay to ask Mr. Hayden to clarify? We can, yes. Mr. Hayden. So thank you. Yeah, the, the um, I, I'm sorry I missed um, the 2018 meeting. I was away. Um, but in the years previous, I recall, and I'm of an age where recollection is something that can be tricky, that the, the 50 feet was defined from the ridge line. Um, it may have been from the lot line, and that, that's a, so um, yes, and I, I, um, I think Steve got it right when he guessed that what I'm looking for is to keep what was there, the restrictions that were there, they seem to be correct. So, okay. thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. And I would like just to remind the board and the public that, um, you know, condition two gets into prior to the issuance of a building permit for for whatever would be there, a residence, a single family home, et cetera, um, that, that the board would review the site plan, the grading, the drainage plan, the siting of the residence and outbuildings, um, driveway, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I believe Steve had mentioned that earlier, but um, so, you know, abutters or uh, can re review review the, what is um, being proposed in the future at, at a, a ZBA meeting. Right. This action we're taking tonight is just to continue the flag lot. It is not, there's no building permit being granted and that would require an addition, any building permit would require additional hearings from the ZBA. All right, um, what I'd like to do is, is finalize these conditions and then move on to the, uh, the findings. Are there any comments or questions? If not, I'd like to, I'd like a motion to approve these conditions. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, any dis further discussion? If not, a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Chair, you, yep. you could you could approve the conditions <laughs> as part of the, your decision for this special permit and do it in one. We can motion. do it in one, but but I, tonight I wanted to do this first, just so we knew what we were that these would apply to the findings that we have to make because they they help to make the findings. So I understand that's a good point. Normally we do it that way, Maureen, but I thought tonight we should establish these conditions and then that helps us move through the findings that we have to make. So roll call vote, um, I vote aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Barrett? Aye. But that motion was approved. Now we need to go through uh, findings for section 6.3 in the flag lots. Um, the area of the flag, this deals with the first 6.32 deals with the size of the flag lot. This flag lot is substantially over the minimum size required. 6.33 deals with the access strip. And, and if anybody has questions while I'm going through this, please raise your hand and let me know. But I'm going to run through these and assume that, that um, you are, are uh, in concert with these findings from, from the staff review for the most part. Um, this deals with 6.33 deals with the access strip. Um, it is in, in compliance with the access strip. It's supposed to be 40 feet wide, it's 43. The width of the portion of the lot where the Prince build building is to be constructed shall um, be equal to or exceed the distance normally required from steep frontage. This means the flag lot meets the requirement it is much wider than 150 feet in all directions. 6.35, the portion of the flag lot, which is a principal building is to be located, shall be considered a building area. 
The flag lot meets the requirements because it can, it can contain a circle within 150 foot diameter. The basic minimum lot frontage is 150 for the RO zoning district in order to comply with section 6.35. Condition number three that, we've, that we just agreed to shall remain. 6.36, there's no more than three flag lots adjacent. This is the only flag lot. 6.37 deals with, um, um, again, uh, access strips. The first is unimpeded access shall be provided across the access strip or an easement at least 20 feet wide. Um, there's an old gravel and when there is a, a plan for a building, this will, be, this will have to be approved the driver with the access strip or easement shall have adequate drainage and shall not exceed five feet in grade within 50 feet of the intersection. It, from the survey, it looks like that's the case, um, an approximate grade of 4% along most of its length, but it won't become steeper as it approaches Southeast Street. Again, I think there's no reason to impose uh, to, um, I mean, this can be dealt with, this will be dealt with when there's a building permit at a later point in time. Um, Aquifer recharge protection. Um, I think um, condition five and condition two deal with that. And especially the, and the residue from the apple orchard, condition two deals with that as well. Um, we do, I did note that the special permit decision had a, I mean, the project um, application report had a mistake in the uh, special permit decision dealing with condition one. So we've corrected that. We're, we're quoting the same condition as before. Now we move to section 10.38 findings. The proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed and or the town as deemed appropriate by the special permit granting authority. Um, I think we find that the proposed flag lot is not suitable for the site, is suitable for the site and is compatible with existing uses and other uses permitted by right in the RO zoning district. I didn't want to give anybody a heart attack with that mistake. Uh, 10.382, 10.383, 10.385, and 10.387 all generally deal with nuisance to air, water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, et cetera. Um, and it protects adjoining premises against detrimental and offensive uses. This inclusion of the flag lot is within an area that does, and does not constitute a nuisance to the surrounding properties since the future home will be set well back from the road from adjacent properties and further the property abuts conservation land to the north where there will be no additional neighbors. Um, it has adequate and appropriate facilities. 10.384 has adequate and appropriate facilities which would be provided for the proper reparation of the proposed use. Per condition number two, the board shall review and approve final site plan prior to issuance of a building permit. 10.386, the proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations Again, condition two will require that we do that uh, if, if and when there's a building permit prior to, prior to issuing a building permit. 10.387, the proposal provides a convenient and safe vehicular movement within the area. Again, condition two, um, could, the board will review and approve the final revised site plan prior to issuance of a board of a building permit for the residents. 10.388, Proposal ensures adequate space for off street loading and unloading of goods. Again, condition two will review the final site plan prior to the issuance of a building permit. 10.389 deals with adequate methods of disposal or storage of sewage waste. Again, condition two will, uh, will govern this and we will um, view, review this before building permit. 10.390. The proposal ensures protection from flood hazards as stated in such factors as elevation of buildings, et cetera. The project is not found to be within a designated flood zone per condition number two, the board shall review and approve the final revised site plan prior to the issuance of a building permit for our residents, at which time the applicant can provide information about the elevation of buildings, drainage, adequacy of sewage, disposal, erosion, runoff, sedimentation, and all. Nothing that we're doing tonight will change the existing conditions um, on the ground. 10.389, uh, protects to the extent feasible, unique or important national or historic scenic features. Preserving the views from nearby Mount, Mount Pollock has been an issue of concern during pre previous reviews of the special permit application. I would amend this staff review to say, um, 
condition one provides the maximum height of the building upon the land being conveyed and shall not exceed 24 feet in the height of the assumed benchmark elevation station 100 at station 36. The board finds that the modification will pro protect to the extent that, that the condition, not the modification, that the condition, that's condition one, will protect to the extent feasible the views from Mount Pollock. So that just uh, incorporates what we did in, in number one. 10.392 proposal provides adequate landscaping, including screening of adjacent residents, provisions of street trees. Again, this deals pr principally with, with um, screening from adjacent properties. This property is not found within a designated flood zone. The board shall review and approve the final revised site plan prior to issuance for a building permit provide information about the elevation of buildings. Is that the right response there, Maureen? Trees, park, and landscape. Not sure. Yeah, I think so. For the, um, regarding the 10.392, right the, uh, 10.392. Oh, oh Single, sure. 10.392 is adequate landscaping. It doesn't really deal with flood mm, mm, mm. I think we just have a glitch there on 10.392. Not so. This is yeah. This is I think we just had the wrong uh, staff review here, but um, well, I think what we have to say is that, that there isn't. A, it does provide adequate. I mean, it's 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 far enough away from other properties to at this point. Um, it doesn't provide a. There's, there's no change, and we will look at a site plan review before um, granting a building permit. So um, we can redo this condition or this staff review is finding to incorporate where we said before how we're going to look at the um, sure. ZBA will look at it before final um, building permit. Mm -hmm. 10.393 proposal provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing intrusion of lighting, including parking lots, exterior lighting, etc. Again, we're going to review it uh, per condition two. 10.394, the provision avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wet lines. Again, um, I think we just modify that staff review, our finding uh, to, to read, delete the modification of, and just say condition one will help avoid to the extent feasible impact on, add the words impact on scenic views as per condition two, and then just continue on. Um, at this time, the applicants can provide, when, he, when there's a building permit, they can provide information about the impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, great changes. There are no wetlands in this parcel. Did you get that, Maureen? Mm -hmm. okay. um, 10.395, the proposal does not create disharmony, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is not applicable to this project. Uh, the proposal provides screenings for storage areas. Again, this is at this time, the finding is not applicable to this project. 10.397 is not applicable dealing with recreational facilities, 10.398. The proposal is in, harmon is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw. Uh, the, and I think we find that it is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaws and of the master plan. Those are the findings um, we have to make. There's no other findings that we have to make in this particular prop application. Um, so with the adoption of the conditions from our previous vote, um, this is the time to discuss if um, I put a mo I would entertain a motion to approve the special permit with conditions. At that point, we can discuss uh, if we want to approve it or amend the uh, amend the conditions or amend the um, the findings in any way. So, is there a motion to approve? Go ahead, Maureen. Uh, I just wanted to uh, suggest an additional condition, which is uh, regarding uh, approving the uh, recently um, submitted A and R plan. Um, which is a digital, digitized version of the uh, older, uh, the previously approved plans um, and, and to make a, a condition that approves all, all those plans um, and you know, state the sheet name, the, who prepared it and the date uh, for future reference. For reference. That's just good practice to have that. Yep, since we're continuing it. Okay, so you, you will draft that you would you go ahead and draft that and we understand the intent of what you're doing. Um, and so we will include that by reference when we, uh, if we approve the application. Mm -hmm. And um, if there are any uh, uh, 
substantial changes uh, to those plans that the, that the applicant would need to come back uh, to the board for review and approval. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, is there a motion to approve the special permit application with conditions, including the conditions uh, stated by Maureen, the conditions stated by Maureen? Um, do we have a motion to do that? So moved. Ms. Parks is second. Mr. Mr. Barrick, did I hear you? Second. I did. <laughs> All right. Um, this, is there a discussion on the application, the conditions, or the finding? Hearing no discussion, um, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the application with conditions, including the condition uh, stated by or described by Maureen. This is a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Barrick? Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Sofield, congratulations. Thank you all. Great. Good luck. Thanks. I can leave now, Maureen? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next order of business is ZBA FY 2021-16. Andrew and Sheila Jones request a special permit in order to allow the pre-existing non-conforming one family detached dwelling to be structurally altered and expanded into the required side yard setback by 13 feet, adding 237.9 square feet to the proposed house addition under sections 9.22 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 279 Amity Street, map 14A, parcel six, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. We continue the same panel for this, uh, this matter. Are there any disclosures? If not, um, site visits were conducted on May 26th and May 27th. I attended the, 20, the, the meeting on the 27th. We met the applicant and, the, uh, and Mr. Reedy at the, the site. We walked around to the um, proposed, the area of proposed expansion of the, um, the house. It's a pad, we observed it was a patio. We observed the lot line and the existing encroachment on the lot line. We observed that um, we talked about the um, design of the building, the, the front of the building and the side of the building, the windows, the roof line. And uh, we observed it and we, um, I think that were, that was the basic, essentially what we did. Um, Dylan, do you have anything to add to that? Or does anybody else from other, site visits have anything to add from the board? Pretty straightforward, is it? Okay. Um, the following submissions have been received by town staff. The application uh, for ZBA 2021-16, email correspondence from uh, attorney Reedy dated April 29th, the site plan prepared by Mr. Eisner dated April 27th, 2021, showing light fixtures, floor plan, exterior elevations prepared by Lawrence Tuttle, um, AIA dated April 22nd, 2021, the south elevation landscaping prepare and date unknown, exterior photographs of building and site, email correspondence from uh, Thomas Reedy dated May 14th, light fixture specifications sheets, um, the applicant's waiver requests from plan requirements of a management plan, a landscape plan, and a sign plan. Uh, planning staff submissions include a zoning map, an aerial map, and a project application report dated May 20th, 2021. Um, who's here to represent the uh, applicant? 
I am, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Reedy, uh, can you go ahead and proceed? Give us your name and address for the record. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Waskevich, Ms. Pollock. I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst. Um, here on behalf of Andrew and Sheila Jones of 279 Amity Street, um, also in Amherst. Um, if I could, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and then I'll probably drive you around a little bit. So if everyone can see my screen, I've got the Amherst GIS map up, just the property map showing property boundaries. I've, I've got highlighted 279 Amity Street right here. Um, most of us, at least today at the site visit, pulled into the driveway here. We walked up the sidewalk um, on the neighbor's property and then down and, and took a look at the area right here, which is, as I'll show in the next um, PDF, where the uh, expansion is going. And so as, as the chairman mentioned, we're asking for relief um, for the alteration of a pre-existing non-conforming structure the lot itself, so there's 122 feet of frontage. However, as everybody's aware, there's a, a building circle requirement where you have to meet the um, 120 feet has to meet the circle where the building is uh, located and we don't meet that. I think it's 109 feet is what's been calculated. So we're non-conforming there, but we're not making any changes. We're also non-conforming as to lot coverage, but because there's already a patio here and I'm not sure that uh, you'll be able to see it, uh, but there's a patio right here and uh, that patio already counts towards the lot coverage. So we're not changing the lot coverage. And then as I'll show, hopefully everybody can see this, we've got Here's where the proposed addition is going to go. You don't need to do that. Um, the property is 2.6 feet, uh, or the building rather is 2.6 feet from this property line. The proposed addition is going no closer than 2.6 feet to that property line. So you have the back side of this chimney right here. And maybe what I'll do is zoom in a little bit so you can all see. It's like it's my first time using a computer and I swear it's not. Okay, you'll see here, here's that proposed addition. This is where that um, patio is, the stone patio is. You'll see that the distance from the corner of this chimney to the property line is 2.6 feet and the proposed addition from this corner to the property line is also 2.6 feet. And so we would suggest this addition uh, is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity, which is also 2.6 feet to the property line. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of what it's going to look like. And I think here you can certainly see it's not going to be detrimental to the neighborhood. I think they've done a really great job. Um, so in front of the house here, Amity Street is at the bottom of your screen little entry vestibule, you'll see that it's stepped back a little bit. So I think that helps the, the house's massing. Um, this is the area of the patio and you'll see the extent of the original footprint is hashed out right there. So this is all going to be a great room. This is uh, for those members that were there today from that abutting properties of the closest one, this is that the side there. And so you've got long window, you know, transom, transom, transom with long window, and then a couple of transoms. I think this is where Andy's probably going to have his television, um, but Sheila could tell him otherwise, I'm sure. Uh, but this is that easterly side, and then this is obviously that uh, from the, the southerly facade, and you'll see that the roof lines, you know, the, uh, the structure of it, the hip roof, um, along with, uh, and I don't know enough to call it flashing, but it's probably something more elegant than that along the base of the, the roof line. So this is what they're proposing. Um, and I can probably show you one more here with the landscaping. You've got obviously Amity Street um, descends from east to west. 
there, there are some uh, evergreen plantings in front of the house. And then this is essentially what it, it would look like. And then this is just for those who haven't seen it, this is what's existing. And so you know, this is the area that is going to be changed along with the roof line. And then like I had pointed out, we're gonna have a, a hip roof there. Um, also as part of this, um, Andy and Sheila are gonna redo the entirety of their lights. So they're gonna change all of their lights to be dark sky compliant. Um, I'm happy to go through and point out each of the locations that they're going to exist in. It has been submitted to the record. Um, I don't want to bore the board, uh, but they are all dark sky compliant. There is a key. So there's a legend uh, on one of the plans showing where the uh, fixtures are and what fixtures would be going there. So the board obviously can reference that, but you know, without belaboring it, because I, I do think this is pretty straightforward, you know, we would suggest that the board can approve it because it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And obviously, we're happy to answer any questions. I know that one came up today, which maybe I'll just beat you to it, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I think one of the questions was about the abutters. This actually says it's Andy and Sheila's, which it is not. It was conveyed, I want to say, in, was it, it was either 2020 or 2021 to, I think, John Evitz and Lindsey Berry. There's a trust that actually owns this. And it's, a, it's land court. This is land court. And this is land court as well. They're both uh, registered land. So hopefully with that, um, the board can make their findings. And uh, any questions, we're happy to answer. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Um, The one thing I noticed is that um, on the, there are several incursions into the side setback already pre-existing. Um, you have incursions of 2.6 feet, 3.9 feet. But farther up, you have 4. Point, I think it's 4.6 feet and 8 points. So there's there's several existing uh, incursions into the to the setback already. Um, those are pre-existing. Correct. Yeah. You so got on. Seven, three, yep. four, six, 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 six. Yep. And I don't even know if this back here is, this deck is far enough away. I guess it's maybe 15 feet, but I'm not sure. And even then, um, yeah, they probably yeah. just didn't even bother because it's further away yeah. than I think the rest of the stuff. So yep. Randy got tired of measuring. So, um, I mean, the real question is whether I mean, everything, you can't do anything about the 120 square feet that already exists and you're not, you're really not changing that. Um, and the other is the lot coverage, and that's maintained. That remains the same, if I correct understand this correctly. So the only seems like the only question for the board is whether there should be a side setback incursion of that only allows two point six feet, um, a second incursion into the side setback that only allows two point six feet from the uh, from the lot line. It seems to me that's the only question for the board to answer at this point. It, and we should care about the, the light too, but they're all dark sky compliance. I read the cut sheet. Um, on my, in my, for, as far as I'm concerned, it seems to be carrying on something that's already being done on that property and hasn't, uh, and it isn't an additional um, detriment to the neighborhood. But I'd like to hear from other people on the, the board and see what questions and comments other board members have. So I open it up to any board member. All right, no Dylan. comments from, oh, I can't see, uh, from what I see, I don't see anybody uh, raising their hand. Oh. Somebody have their hand. Oh, there you go, Dylan, the, yeah. the view didn't have you. No worries. Um, have we heard from any, any statements from the member of the public, uh, neighbors who, I mean, specifically the, the neighbor right there, who, do they have anything to say about the, the 2.6 incursion or have we heard from them? Are they at this meeting? Uh, yeah, um, no yeah, no, uh, I, um, I haven't received any uh, public comments or comments from uh, any of the town departments. And everyone was all about is duly notified, I assume. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, then um, I, I guess I'll just say, yeah, as long as the immediate neighbor has no objections to it, but it all seems to be kind of in line with what's already there.
Um, all right, any other comments? If not, we'll go to public comments, if any. I don't see anybody with their hands up, Maureen. Not uh, correct, yep. Oh, all right. Um, I have no further comments and the I, I don't see any reason to um, continue this further. What I'd like to do is um, move to the public meeting on this where we consider conditions and findings we have to make. Um, as we did before, there are no, two very simple conditions, um, pretty standard conditions that are included almost all the time that the first condition is the project shall be built according to approved plans and maintained as needed. Uh, any substantial changes from the approved plan shall come back before the VBA at a public meeting. And then we reference then in that condition, I reference the um, specific site plans, drawings, maps, uh, elevations and light fixtures. So um, if they change from this and what they submitted, they have to come back to us. And lastly, all the pretty much standard dark sky compliant uh, according to ZBA rules and regulations lighting uh, condition. Those are things that are um, normally included in, in any app, in any uh, approval, any conditions for approval of a, of a special permit. Um, did anybody have any problems with these conditions? If so, I'll speak up now. Otherwise, I'd like to move to um, our findings and then we'll vote all in one in this case because it's pretty simple stuff, I think. First, first finding we have to make is on 9.22, 9.22 reads, the special permit granting authority is authorized to act under the provisions of section 3.3 of this bylaw, may under a special permit allow a non-conforming use of a building, structure, or land to be changed to a specified use not substantially different in character or in its effect on the neighborhood or on property in the vicinity. Said authority may also authorize under a special permit, a non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be extended or non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged or reconstructed, provided that the authority finds that such alteration, enlargement or reconstruction shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or non-conforming building. So 9.22 requires that we make the determination that the non-conforming uh, construction uh, is not more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming um, use of the building. And I, I am prepared to make that determination. Now, um, the staff response on this goes through the three areas, the side setback, which is the 2.6, uh, incursion of, of leaving only 2.6 uh, feet of the side setback. The lot coverage, which has not changed, but if there's a structure where there was hardscape now, and three building area of the frontage lot, which pre-existed and, and, and can't be changed. So um, I'm prepared to make the find, I'm, I think we should make the finding that this is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood and it's in compliance with section 9.22. Any objection? If not, I'll move on. Then we have 10.38 and Proposal is suitably 10.38 and 10.381 deals with suitability of a location uh, in proposed in the town and deemed appropriate by the special granting authority. The proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood and is compatible with the existing owner occupied single family homes. I think we can see that from the drawings and the elevations in the surrounding residential neighborhood. The applicant is reporting, proposing to build an addition to their existing single family home. 10.382, 10.383. 10.385 and 10.387. The proposal would not constitute a nuisance due to air, water pollution, odor, dust, vibration, lights. Uh, it really protects adjoining, reasonably projects adjoining premises against detrimental offensive units and uh, water pollution, flood, noise, dust, dust vibration, etc. The application proposes to replace all non compliant light fixtures, so it solves that problem. And the proposed addition includes a door entrance on the east building facade. The existing stone walkway from the said door connects the subject property to the budding property that be taken out, is it not? Yeah, that, that doesn't exist. So we wanna, I think Maureen, we wanna amend this 
um, staff review here to delete the um, connecting walkway, delete that sentence. All right, and the property owners are, are not uh, the same. So we have to delete that second sentence. So we end that uh, review with uh, the word facade. 10.384, uh, adequate and appropriate facilities provided for proper operation, utility services are found existing. 10.386, the proposal ensures that in conformance with parking and sign regulations, there are two parking spaces provided for the single family home, no signage is required or proposed. 10.387, uh, the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site in relation to adjacent streets, property or improvement. If we, can, if we have, are, are concerned about that, we can require a traffic uh, impact statement. Um, safe, I, I find that we find that the safe um, vehicular traffic and pedestrian movement is found on the site. Um, 10.388 is not applicable. It deals with off-street loading and unloading of vehicles. 10.389 proposal provides adequate methods of disposal or storage for sewage, refuge, recycled. The applicant has requested a waiver from submitting a management plan. The submitted site plan does not indicate the location of where the trash and recycling bins are stored and whether they're enclosed or screened. The board may wish to see its location. When we were there, I didn't notice the location of the of the trash cans. I didn't seem to. I didn't even ask. Um, are they behind the? They're behind the garage. Yeah, they're, they're you know? certainly not in in public view. In sight, right? Kept in the garage or tucked around that that driveway. Yeah, they're in the back. I, I, I didn't see them. Did anybody else notice them at the, at the site visit? Which is an excellent point. If nobody else noticed it, right? That, that's yeah. <laughs> that was the that's the conclusion I'm drawing here from this. Um, 10.390, the proposal ensures protection from flood hazards as stated in section 3.228, considering such factors as elevation of building, drainage, adequacy of sewage disposal, et cetera. The property is not found within a designated flood zone. It's not applicable to this. And 10.391 is also not applicable because it's not in the Lincoln Sunset Historic District. 10.392, the proposal provides adequate um, Landscaping, including screening of adjacent properties. Um, the lands, the applicant has requested a waiver from submitting a landscape plan. Um, and we've seen the, from the um, drawings, plans for, uh, I think, Arborvitae or the plans along the property line with the abutting neighbors. Um, but we have not, but you've requested a waiver from a landscape plan. And I, I think we can find that. 10.393, the proposal provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting. We dealt that, this is basically um, dark sky required in the lighting um, is contained and referenced in the conditions. 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes. Again, this is not applicable to the project. 10.395 does not create the proposal does not create create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings. Um, the submitted south elevation plan shows the height of the proposed addition to be lower than the existing building height. The style seems to be proportionate with and matches the existing building. Um, and the um, south elevation elevated plan, in my opinion, it, it views the, it fits nicely in the neighborhood and, and uh, works with other uh, homes in the neighborhood. 10.396, the proposal provides adequate screening for storage areas. Doc, this, um, again, this trash and recycling are back behind. We did not see them, so it's, they're screened. 10.397 provides adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities for proposed use. We find that there's sufficient open space located on the site. 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purposes and intents of the bylaws and the goal of the master plan. Um, the proposal provides proposal building addition to the owner occupied single family home at the subject properties in harmony with the master plan. The board needs to determine whether the proposal meets the applicable zoning bylaw sections, including section 9.22 and 10.38, which we just did. Um, are there any questions regarding from board members, any questions regarding 
the findings of 10.38 or 9.22. All right. Um, the, the next order of business would be a motion to approve the special permit with the conditions as laid out in the, and as amended in the staff um, project application report and make the findings and necessary findings of 9.22 and 10.38. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved, Mr. Maxfield, is there a second? Second. second. Yeah, we have three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any discussion? If there's no discussion, um, this is a roll call vote. The chair votes uh, roll call vote on approving the special special permit application with conditions. Um, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. And Mr. Barrett? Aye. Motion approved unanimously. Um, special permit is granted. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Good seeing everybody. Have a great long weekend. Bye bye. You too. Thank you. Uh, the next order of business is ZBA 2021 17, College Street 1957 LLC. Requests a special permit in order to allow a change of use from a one family detached dwelling to a non-owner occupied duplex dwelling. Extension and alteration of the lot coverage and building area on a pre-existing non-conforming lot. Modifications of required additional lot area uh, slash family under dimensional regulations, footnote A, sections 3.211, 9.22 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 187 College Street, map 14B, parcel 169, general residence RZ, RG zoning district. Members of this panel are the same as we've had all night. Are there any disclosures? Sites, site visits were conducted on May 26th and May 27th. Um, I can report on the visit on the 27th. We arrived at the property we viewed the, um, from the parking lot side of the property, we viewed the extension of the, um, the new, new dwelling unit that would, is proposed, where the garage is located and or where the garage was located, but where the cement pan is currently located. We walked the front of the building, um, tried to get in to see the building, but we, it was um, locked and we weren't able to see the interior of the, of the existing structure. Um, we noted a, we did note a light fixture under the porch of the existing structure seemed to be loose. And there was questions asked at, at the time about whether that was going to be replaced. We, it, uh, it wasn't clear. We um, walked to the back to look at the site regarding the um, elevation of the second of a new unit, the difference between the, the common, I guess it'd be a common doorway between the new unit and the old unit for access to the basement. We looked at that. We walked around to the back and looked at the lot, the, what appeared to be the lot line for the, um, the property where the proposed berm would be to um, mitigate runoff into the uh, wetlands behind it. Um, and we walked the, walked the lot line there and examined what, what was the vegetation that existed. We then looked at the, prop, the um, parking area uh, tried to line up the parking area with the, um, the house and the, that exists and the neighboring house. And we looked at where the um, fencing would be along the lot line of the neighboring house to the, the house is to the east, east isn't it? Is it not? Yeah, east to the east. East to the east, house to the east. We did that as well. Um, and we looked at the elevation and compared the heights of the houses and, and those in the neighborhood. I think that pretty much sums up the extent of the site visit. Maureen or uh, Dylan, if you have anything, Mr. Back Maxfield, if you have anything to add, I think that pretty much sums up the questions we asked and the nature of the, um, the site visit. 
Um, does anybody else have anything to add from earlier times? Um, the town has received the following submissions. So ZBA application, a management plan, including an additional information required for apartments, supplemental information prepared by Valley Management dated April 23rd, which includes project description, sample lease, complaint response form, reference photos for neighborhood compatibility, exterior light fixtures, details, and specifics. Um, I guess those are cut sheets for the, um, the light fixtures, sample parking permit, and addition, re additional reference photos. It also, we've also received a plan set consisting of five sheets, um, which includes uh, a plot of the land, demolition plan, a layout plan, a grading and planting plan, and a proposed lighting and photometric plan. There's a building plan, uh, which includes three sheets, which is elevation, a floor plan, and foundations, all prepared by Laura's architecture and drafting design dated April 23rd, 2021. There's, the staff has submitted a zoning map, an aerial map, a topography map, wetlands, and NHSP map. Uh, as I said, a project application report dated May 20th, comments from the town engineer, and dated May 19th. Comments from Fire Prevention Officer Mike Roy dated May 19th, 2021. In addition, I'm told that the planning board has requested that they be able to review the application and provide comments to the ZBA before we take final action on the application. The planning board could review this application at its June 16th meeting and provide comments to us after that. I'm inclined to grant the request of the planning board. Um, and my inclination would be to, that the board grant the request to the planning board. And as a result, it's my recommendation that tonight we conduct a public hearing on the application and continue that public hearing into the next meeting date subsequent to the planning board meeting. So I think the next meeting date would be sometime in July then, because I don't think we can meet in late June. Uh, we have a, an early June meeting, a late June meeting might be tough. Um, so it would be in late June or early July, or probably early July. So those are the, the submissions that we've received. And um, the last was something we learned this afternoon, just before, uh, or just after the site visit. So who is here to represent the applicant? Um, so we, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, uh, I am Michael Liu from the Berkshire Design Group, site designer. Um, Alan St. Hilaire from Valley Property Management is on, but Alan, you have to unmute yourself. If you see, you see the little microphone. Got it. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, Good. Great. Proceed. And then, Ms. and you're in your address again, Mr. Liu? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess um, we were planning to have Alan give a, a quick introduction and um, go over the um, architecture. And then I would um, give a presentation on the site design and layout and then um, just, you know, basically open it up to um, comments and questions from the board. Um, well, we just need your address. I know you're at oh, Berkshire. I'm sorry. Uh, Berkshire Design Group for Allen Place, Northampton, Massachusetts. Mr. St. Hilaire. Uh, Alan St. Hilaire, Valley Property Management. Uh, do you also need my address? Just, yep. That's just PO Box 3649 Amherst, Massachusetts. Thank you. Proceed. Okay, so I'm happy to do the project overview and review the architecture of the property uh, and kind of explain the, the site and the neighborhood and how it will be no more impactful or detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, I did have a quick question before we jump into that. The planning board, the request for the planning board, is can someone explain what they might be looking for so that we can be prepared for that? Are there certain aspects of the project they wanna look at? Is it the architecture? Is it the site? You know, I, I all I know is the, re the request was made, Mr. St. Hilaire. Um, I think that it's probably part of the, um, I don't know the answer to that. 
I can assume that some of the questions may relate to the um, additional uh, coverage, uh, additional lot size needed for a second unit, the second duplex is, is a item that the planning board is dealing with in other contexts. Maybe that's part of it, maybe it isn't, I'm not sure. But um, they, Maureen, do you have any indication or Dave, do you have any indication of what they're Sure, uh, are? so um, uh, all um, applications, uh, ZBA applications are um, provide, um, the sort of legal ad or agenda items are um, provided to the planning board. And at their uh, meetings, they actually review ZBA applications. And from time to time, they make requests uh, to the ZBA for uh, referral um, of, as they would like to have a presentation and provide the ZBA recommendations. So this is a standard procedure. Uh, the planning board doesn't do it you know, for every application, but uh, if there's an application of interest, they would like to see it. So um, wh while you could email Chris Brestrup uh, directly to see if there's anything uh, specific that they would like to see, I, I think it would be safe to say that you should provide them your general presentation, similar of what you're doing today tonight and uh, I'm sure the planning board would then have a discussion um, with you and amongst themselves and then they would make recommendations for uh, recommendations to the zoning board of appeals for their consideration. Thank you. Okay, great. So I will jump into it. Uh, the first thing I'd like to present is the neighborhood. Uh, we are here. Uh, See if I can share my screen here. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see my screen there? I've got the uh, GIS viewer up. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. So this is the subject property 187 College. This is where the garage was. A uh, couple things I'd like to point out. There are quite a few, I would say the majority of the properties along this stretch of the road are in fact rentals. Many of them are multi-unit rentals. I've got some uh, photos for reference that I will touch on later. And uh, four doors down, we have Amherst College Physical Plant and across the street, Leader Lumber. And in the other direction, four doors down, we have uh, Fort Hill Auto Body and Enterprise Rent-A-Car. So it's, it's a mixed use uh, commercial, heavily traveled state road, College Street is Route 9, tens of thousands of cars a day up the road. Uh, so that's the idea of the site. Uh, the addition would be going to the south of the property, uh, further away from the road. Parking, of course, Mike can review the site plan, but the parking would be to the east of the property. That is the uh, neighborhood uh, of the subject property. And what I'd like to do now is jump over to the architectural plans so that I can show you what the property addition will look like. These are the elevation views here. And for reference, College Street is out here to the north. This section of the property is the existing house, the existing single family house. And the two-story portion here to the south would be the proposed addition. The north elevation, of course, is what you would see from the street. And the roof lines here represent the existing structure. The roof line that's a bit taller represents the proposed addition. Similarly, this is the south elevation, which is predominantly the addition. There is a small piece of the existing dwelling off to the left here that shows through the elevation. And the west elevation, again, the two lower portions are the existing and the two-story portion here is the proposed. It's worth noting that we, we are stepping down the addition by approximately two feet. 
there is a grade change that drops off from the north to the south of the property. And we are following that with the addition and the elevations of the addition. Jumping over to the floor plans. And Maureen, I, I heard through Mike uh, that today you asked about photos of the interior, which I did send earlier this afternoon. And I'm happy to share and present those at the meeting as well. Uh, so what we have is uh, in the existing dwelling, this is the first floor plan. Uh, we have a bedroom, a front hallway and stairway, living room, dining room, kitchen, and two bathrooms next to each other. The driveway for reference is off to the east side here. The proposed addition, first floor, and let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit, make it easier to see. This is the proposed addition. So it will be a one bedroom, open concept, live and dining kitchen uh, with a laundry room and bathroom on the first floor, uh, exterior covered staircase that goes out to the parking area. Uh, on the second floor, we have, um, again, the existing dwelling footprint on the second floor. You come up the set of stairs into a small hallway with three bedrooms off of that hallway. Uh, this is just an attic over the first floor. And the addition down here to the south would consist of uh, stairs coming up to a small hallway, two bedrooms with a bathroom and a master suite with uh, its own bathroom and a walk-in closet. The uh, foundation, the existing basement, as you'll see in the photos that I will share next, is unfinished open space. Uh, some mechanicals down there and shelving. There's a boiler off to the back side of the building. Uh, the addition basement will include a common hallway to maintain exterior access to the existing basement space. Uh, and it will be up and out of a hatchway to the exterior and we'll have a separate doorway into the proposed addition. This is a fire rated fire door, common hallway in compliance with building regulations. So the basements will be completely separate but they share a hallway for exterior access. This basement will be unfinished. There will be uh, mechanicals down there, propane, boiler, hot water heater, and uh, just storage. There will not be any finished space in the proposed basement. Any questions about the floor plans before I show the interior photos? You can ask questions when you're done, if you're allowed. I oh. would, unless, unless they're um, just purely clarification questions, we can. Board members will ask questions when you're done with your presentation. Okay, perfect. So at this point, I'll jump over to the interior photos. Uh, coming right in off the door, the existing entry from the south is the kitchen. Another view of the kitchen. The two bathrooms are directly off the kitchen. There's a bathroom door to the right here and an open bathroom door to the left. That shows the bathroom number one, bathroom number two. Living room, which is right off the kitchen. The door you're seeing in front of you is the, the kitchen door and the open door is the exterior door out to that side porch. Dining room off the living room. First bedroom, which is on the first floor front hall and stairway, bedroom number two, which is on the street side of the second floor. Number three is on the south side, the back side, way furthest from the street, as is bedroom number four. Uh, unfinished basement, unfinished basement. These views here just show the uh, photos that closely match the elevation views, the east elevation from the parking area, College Street off to the right here, 
southerly elevation. This is the face of the existing dwelling where the addition, the proposed addition would uh, contact would uh, tie into. Kind of a southwesterly view to show you the existing structure. West elevation, College Street off to your left in the photo. Uh, north elevation showing the front porch and the roof line. Uh, there was a question about the light fixture on this porch. Uh, it, it is underneath the porch roof. So by definition, you know, there would be no light going up into the sky. It's dark sky compliant. Uh, Northeasterly view. So the College Street is behind us in this view. Those are the photos. And uh, I believe that is what I wanted to cover. I'll jump back to the architectural plans to show the, uh, actually, I think I have a site plan for that. The side setback is not going to be any more non-conforming than the existing side setback. So I'll share that screen to show that. The existing uh, house on the northerly side uh, is within the 10 foot side setback. The proposed addition will not be within that side setback. So we're not increasing the non-conformity there. Um, and Mike uh, from Berkshire Design will talk about the coverages and, and those aspects of the non-conformities. But I did want to point out, because it relates to the building positioning, that it does not increase the side setback uh, any further than is already existing. Is there any part of the management plan that the board would like me to review or specifically comment on? I noticed that you did not you did not include a um, a contact a on site contact. I suspect that's something that you don't know until you have tenants. Is that correct? Is that the reason you didn't you included a um, emergency contact, but there's not a, a contact on property? Uh, I was unaware that that was something that the board was requesting because it is simply a duplex. It is uh, managed uh, offsite, of course. Um, and in prior meetings of this nature, we didn't come across that request. So I didn't know that that was something you were looking for, but it certainly could be provided. Okay. You can proceed to the... Um site plan. Okay. At this point, I'll turn it over to Mike Liu of Berkshire Design. Um, all right, thanks. Before I, um, I get started with the site plan, there was a question that came up today about the height of the structure. So I measured those off the plans. Um, obviously, we didn't have time to go out and take physical measurements, but according to the plans, um, and I don't have an exhibit prepared, I didn't have time to do that, but um, the existing house the height from ground level to the peak is 23 feet, six inches. And to the mid roof line is 19 feet, three inches. Just to let you know. And on the addition, the two story addition to the peak of the roof, I measured 29 feet, six inches. And to the mid roof line, 24 feet, six inches. Um, so it was noted that that information didn't seem to be anywhere on the plan. So um, certainly we can add that to the to the final plans if that's requested. But I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Um, all right, let me see. Bear with me while I grab my um, plan set here. I might do a little bit of hopping around from page to page. Whoops. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, whoops, come on. All right. So I'm gonna um, maybe jump to the layout plan here first. As Alan mentioned, um, 
about the setback. So first of all, here's the site. Um, this line type here indicates the property extents. College Street is over here on the right, which is to the north. So north is to the right, south is to the uh, left, east down and west upper part of the page. Um, this site does have non-conformities in the setbacks. The existing house is 8.4 8 feet to this corner and eight, about 8.5 feet to this corner to the property line. Um, the addition would be about 12 and a half feet to the property line to this corner and 12.6 um, feet to this corner. So as Al, yeah, as Alan mentioned, we're not you know getting any closer to the property line than you know the existing what the existing condition is. Um, the other nonconformity on the site is the coverage. Uh, currently, uh, you know, according to the survey that was done and um, taking those areas. Uh, the maximum, well, the, the um, coverage requirement in this zone is 40% for site coverage. Um, ex in existing conditions, it's 41.4%. Um, in the proposed conditions, we are actually reducing the coverage to 40.8. So, you know, a few tenths of percentage points, um, but it's, it's worth noting. And um, I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, again, here's the existing house, the addition, the parking is proposed here along the uh, east side, utilizing the existing curb cut on College Street, coming in on a driveway um, and then um, providing eight parking spaces that will face the structure. Um, there are parking blocks that separate it from a walkway. Um, and here we have a walk that uh, connects up a flight of steps to the porch. And this walk, this portion of the existing walk will be retained to provide access to the front uh, porch. We are proposing to remove this section of walk that goes out to College Street. It's not really used. And uh, that's, you know, one way where we're trying to, you know, kind of get rid of impervious area on the site to reduce coverage and, you know, get it to balance out. Um, as you saw from the um, site visits, you know, there were um, orange flags placed at, approx at the approximate corners of the addition so you could get a sense of the, um, um, you know, the, fo the footprint for the addition there. Um, in terms of um, other, other aspects of the site, we are providing uh, dumpsters and um, recycle containers here along the, si along the walkway. Also being offered is a bike rack um, along the uh, walkway. Um, cars will be prevented from accessing the rear lawn. You know, we definitely want to reserve that for, you know, the residents use. Um, we are proposing to use um, lo some large stones, large low stones along the edge of the uh, parking area here. So the cars cannot drive onto the front, uh, onto the rear lawn. Um, during yesterday's site meeting, a comment was made about, is there a way to prevent cars from driving onto the front lawn? Um, we discussed a couple of things. Um, what I think that um, Alan's um, preference is to leave this open. Let me just um, skip to the grading plan for a second here. Whoops. Okay, here is the grading and planting plan. Um, we are proposing to have so, a couple of arborvitae shrubs in the front here to screen the parking area from College Street. Um, there's some smaller shrubs, some evergreen inkberry on this side of the um, uh, litter and recycle bins. Um, but we, I guess Alan and I both feel the same that we'd like to keep the front area open. Um, you know, we don't want to uh, extend the plantings along the driveway. What we're proposing is that, you know, the, the, the change in grade will almost be a natural barrier to prevent cars from driving off the driveway onto the grass. Um, it, we can adjust the grading so that we can create, you know, a, um, a one foot plus slope up to um, the lawn area. Um, so hopefully that'll be um, um, an adequate um, method to prevent cars from driving up. If, um, if there's any, you know, uh, serious concern about that, we can even berm it up a little bit higher. 
um, and create a taller berm, but we still like the idea of leaving an open um, lawn area without fencing or um, hedges or, or more shrubs. Um, in regard to screening, we are proposing a um, wood stockade fence along the east property line. You can kind of see it back here beyond this uh, you know, dark line, which represents the erosion control. Um, but we were standing out in the field and the, the fencing starts opposite you know, the parking spaces. And if you extend this line to the abutter, we figured that it was gonna come in um, about three or four feet behind the front corner of the abutting house or almost at the first window on the uh, west side of the abutting house. Um, the grading and drainage is such that existing conditions, it basically water flows from um, the north part of the site and, and leaves the south, south side of the site. Uh, there is wetland associated with a, a, a ditch on the Amherst College land um, it's pretty far back from the property line, um, but we are proposing to add a, a infiltration swale. Um, you know, we're gonna, people might call it a rain garden. It's not a proper rain garden in that, you know, we're not, you know, putting a, a heavy layer of sand under there for drainage, but this will intercept uh, runoff and uh, slow it down, filter it. And when the pool overflows, you know, it'll go back toward the wetland as it does in existing conditions, but it'll be uh, water that's been somewhat treated to take out the sediments that might be, uh, that might run off um, from the stormwater. The, um, the southern line and the, and the um, infiltration swale are planted with native species. Uh, we did present this to the Conservation Commission in, um, I think it was January of 2020. We, um, received a negative determination from the Conservation Commission with a couple of conditions, um, and meaning that they felt that they agreed that this project would not have adverse impact on the wetlands. Um, I think before we, we, you know, when we were out in the field, we kind of talked about the extent of the gravel and the, and the existing um, garage, which you can see shown lightly here in this square. Um, and how um, the new impervious surfaces kind of balance out with what's there exi in existing conditions. Um, as I mentioned, we are reducing the uh, coverage by a few tenths of percentage points, but um, due, to the, due to the reduction, technically there is, it, it, it won't increase any runoff from the site. Um, therefore, you know, we, we're, we don't, we are not required to provide um, further drainage uh, for attenuation, uh, for infiltration. It's not required under the uh, stormwater guidelines if you have a reduction in uh, impervious. Uh, but to satisfy conservation's concerns about um, you know, the runoff going in that direction and to keep people from wandering back into the woods and potentially impacting the bank on that swale or the ditch on the Amherst College land, you know, we, we felt that this was a, a pretty good idea to handle the runoff you know, with the vegetation that would, you know, form a barrier to prevent people from wandering off the property and into the, into the uh, wooded area um, that actually belongs to Amherst College. Um, in terms of the lighting, let me jump to the last page there. Um, there are three new lights proposed. Um, as Alan mentioned, there is an existing light which is in the ceiling of the front porch here. It's, um, you know, looking at it, it looks like a pretty low, um, low wattage uh, fixture or at least low wattage bulbs can be used and it's um, enclosed above by the roof. So, um, you know, and it's been in use for I don't know how many years. I can't imagine that um, there's been any complaints about that. Um, but for the new light fixtures, we are proposing um, wall packs, and you can see those in the um, submission pack package. Um, they're basically kind of like enclosed uh, square metal um, fixtures with downcast lights. This is kind of the um, template, excuse me, provided by the manufacturer, which shows the intensity 
dropping off as you get get out to um let me see is that about yeah 15 feet or so and you know we're down to below you know half a foot candle um obviously the highest illuminated zone is right near the light we're proposing one at the corner of the um, addition here above the bulk head or hatchway uh, one at the existing house on this um, uh, easterly facade to provide lighting for the parking and the walks in that area. And then um, an additional fixture here with a shield on the west side so that we don't get light spillage toward the property line. We're going to, you know, trying to focus that light kind of onto the, you know, to the, um, to the south and east into the yard space. Um, I think that's about it for the site. If um, I guess if there's any questions, we can um, to, about the architecture or the management plans or any of that um, or the site, we'll um, be happy to um, hopefully answer them for you. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, the one other thing I'd like to add to the presentation, I, I've taken some photos for reference of neighboring properties, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, kind of demonstrating that the neighborhood makeup and, and that the proposed project would not be out of kind with that. So I will jump over to that. Let's see if I can zoom in here. So. 175 College Street is two doors down uh, up, up College Street, closer to the center of town. So that would be to the west. This mm -hmm. is a very similar uh, property to what we are proposing. That the, the actual structure is, I wouldn't be surprised if it weren't built from the same plans. There's three or four houses along College Street that look like they were stamped out of the same cookie cutter. And there is an addition to the south of that that is very similar in size and scale to what we are proposing. Uh, similarly, across the street from that, uh, 174 College is actually four units, four residential units. That is uh, up closer to leader home centers and leader lumber. Um, 200 College Street, which is nearly directly across the street. Again, a very similar architectural structure. House in the front, a single story connecting structure and a, and a two story house in the back. That is another two unit building. Uh, two doors down from the subject property, of course, is the commercial building with the rental car and the auto body uh, operation. And uh, three or four doors up is the home center and lumber yard, of course. So it's it's our position that what we're proposing is is in kind and, and certainly no more detrimental to the neighborhood. Great, thank you, Mr. Saint Hilaire. Um, time for. Um, comments and questions from board members. Um, I had a couple of questions I wanted to pose. Some are, I just didn't, they're not major, but I'm interested. So you're gonna get rid of the, the sidewalk uh, going through the front door. Um, how do people get mail and deliveries? If you had the mailman walk around, did they get through the parking lot to the how do they get to the houses to do that? I mean, it's easy when you're up front, you have two mailboxes on that front porch, but um, how, how is it gonna happen without it? Yeah, I mean, they, they would have to walk down the driveway and then access the, the walk that's to the west of the parking spaces. Um, and that's, and is that open? Just, I'm just... Well, if they're, if, if the lot was- Or is that park... snow storage? Is that snow storage area? Um, there is there is snow storage on the north uh, side between the last parking space and those uh, shrubs that we showed. So if if it was winter time, yeah, I guess you know they 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 couldn't use that um, pathway, um, but you know they could get to the uh, houses by basically they'd have to walk between the parking spaces. Parking spray and go up to the if, 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 if all the spaces were, you know, taken. 
They do have access to the existing highway going to the parking lot and then going back around front or going up the side stairs, I would call it. Yeah, uh, they can to the right. lower. Okay. All right. They can, they can access the existing house at two locations, the, the porch. That's Which they'd have to walk to the front again. Okay. Right. Or then yeah. walk around to the front porch. Um, All right. And then another question is um, trash receptacles. What is it? What's around? What's the ground surrounding it? It's, it's receptacles are, are out from the the unit. You've got three bushes there of uh, uncertain height. I'm not sure which height. How are they shielded? And what's that rectangular? What's the nature of the rectangular area around them? Is that grass? No, it's um this the parking and the walkway and the area that the um receptacle sit on is all um, stone dust, similar to what is there now, that, that type of the driveway. surface, yeah, yes. Um, I think this has been, you know, Alan um, has used the same um, surfacing on a, a couple of other projects in town. I'm just trying to see the, if that's detailed any place on the drawings. Um, hold on a sec. We have a detail of it on sheet L102, gravel Just paving. Kidding. So it says litter and recycles, bulkhead access. All right, so the bike rack is on grass and the yeah. wood steps and handrail. Yeah. And then what surrounds the um, it, trash receptacles and recycle pins is stone dust. Well, yeah, we have it labeled as trap rock gravel on the detail on the left hand side of the page there, detail number two. It says detail two, yep. two L102 gravel paving. Okay. All right. And then you're going to plant shrubs in. Right behind trap rock gravel. No, behind the pad, behind the, uh, between the receptacles and the porch of the existing house, right. that's grass. Well, that's what I was asking. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I, okay. I was unclear. That, that what area. Is between, what, behind yes. the, yes, is yes. grass. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's grass, that's, yep. All right, got it, that makes sense. And what's the height of the shrubs? Um, those shrubs that can attain a height of, a you know, between three and a half to four feet. And the, what's the height of a trash receptacle? Maybe five four, feet? four and a half. Four and a half to yeah. five feet. Yep, those so they aren't going to aren't going to shield it. So they may not shield it. Okay. We, yeah. If I might uh, just answer that question with a little more clarity. They're they're thirty six inches tall. They're, they're not four and a half feet tall. The the blue trash toters are are thirty six inches tall. Oh, they're only thirty six. Yeah. They seem taller. I, I can get a field measurement, but they're just the you know they they're rolling totes. It's just a bit bigger than a, sure. a residential trash can. It's not a dumpster or anything of that nature. All right. So the point is to shield them, they have to the plants have to be able to grow to be big enough to shield trash receptacles if that's if we're going to accomplish what you say. So I guess the condition that I'm thinking about, Maureen, is making sure that the whatever's planted there is sufficient uh, within a year or two to shield the to actually shield the trash receptacles. We don't have to we don't have to decide the height of the trash bins right now. Um, is there a detail to the stockyard 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 fence? Yes, also on uh, where is P that? Is P that oh that's L1. L1 you know, it's on the back page. Yep. And so there's no gaps between it. The boards abut each other directly. Uh, entirely. Correct. There's no gaps. Okay. Correct. Um, and what were the conservation commission uh, conditions and where are they reflected in the plan or in the drawings? I will, I can read them to you. There were only three conditions. Um, erosion control, well, number one, erosion controls must be installed and inspected by the wetlands administrator prior to the start of work. Um, number two, monitoring of the erosion controls is the responsibility of the site manager during construction and Alan, um, in the duties of Valley Property Management, uh, they will be uh, monitored during, you know, when when the site is, um, you know, opened up for construction. That will be part of their responsibility. 
Um, and number three, the wetlands administrator shall be contacted to inspect prior to removal of erosion controls. So that, I take it that would mean that they want to make sure that the site is stabilized before the erosion controls are removed. Are removed. Yep. And those, being, those conditions from the wetland are incorporated into our conditions. Um, or do they, Maureen, do they have to be incorporated into our conditions or are they separately applicable and, uh, and enforceable by the Conservation Commission? Um, th there is no wrong answer. There is no wrong answer. Either. So you you could you, you could make a condition saying that you know the conditions of the so permit and the then reference the number be shall be you know provided. But Got it. yeah, okay. Those are the, the, my initial questions. I want to open it up to other board members. So, um, Mr. Meadows, you're the first. You got your hand up first. Well, uh, taking off from what you said earlier about the removal of the sidewalk made me think about the location of the parking, the lack of a sidewalk, and maybe it's not our decision, maybe it's something the building inspector or the fire inspector might be concerned with. But if you leave this curb cut the way it is and you have in the evening eight spaces taken and there's an emergency to need to get into the building, how do you bring, if you're coming in with a fire truck or if you're coming with an ambulance, how do you get through the parking spaces to the building effectively with any equipment? And I don't know if that's something that we should be concerned with, but it's something that is, becomes obvious when you think about it. I don't know if I can Maybe, well, maybe Mr. Wiskiewicz has a, a response. I don't know if I can adequately answer that. I doubt that fire trucks enter the site. They're just, you know, there's just not enough room for them to maneuver off College Street. An ambulance certainly might drive into the driveway. Um, well, even if they and, and if any, ambulance was in the driveway or if an ambulance was in front of, on the, on yep, the street. I, hear, I understand. How did it yep. Well, I guess, um, I mean, we really wanted to try to not to not to make the coverage condition worse than it was already, given that it was non-conforming. I believe that, you know, if you if you 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 have to try to not make any non-conformity worse than it already is, given that, you know, we we needed eight spaces to serve the building and we try to keep the everything at a minimum. Um, but getting rid of that walkway, which seemed like it was, you know, not um, heavily used by residents, uh, you know, to walk out to College Street, um, it seemed like uh, one way to, to reduce coverage on the site. If you um, move Mr. Mr. Meadows, if I, if I may, I just, I know that the uh, fire chief had a, uh, a comment on this, but he didn't mention your concerns. He mentioned other concerns and requirements, but he didn't mention that. So it must be, it must comply with existing fire reg, uh, fire department regulations or concerns. Mr. Wasevich, do, can, you have, can you enlighten us on this? Well, I was just gonna say, if there should be a fire at this structure, they will be taking over that street. So they'll be parking on the street primarily. They have a ladder truck, which has a pretty good reach. Um, they won't be able to get to the back, but um, even if you made some room for that to happen, I don't know if they would do that um, just because of the, it looks like the terrain. So, um, and I would think that they would have made comment to that if there was a concern. But I think, I think the question you raised about access from an ambulance or from the street through the sidewalk is, is a good concern. I think that's, we should think about what, what does an ambulance do? if God forbid they need to get in there. Go ahead, Mr. Meadows, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, the, the only other thing I could think of was, was reverse the move, the parking spaces to the, um, to the east and change the curb cut and bring the driveway in where, into where the parking spaces are. Yeah. If I might add to that uh, comment. Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Senator. 
there is a minimum distance from the structure that a vehicle needs to be. And I believe that is also rooted in fire safety. Uh, I know in past projects, we've had to keep them, I believe it's eight feet from the structure. So flipping the parking um, would, would potentially be an issue there. Because now you've got vehicles coming and going uh, hugged against the side of the structure. Hmm. Other questions, comments from board members? Where is the, which, go ahead, Mr. Maxfield, I'm preparing my questions, go ahead. I just want to know, do you know um, offhand, what the difference in, in lot coverage would be if you were to just leave that, that front walkway? Um, does it put you over? Uh, I do I do not. I, I'd have to add that back into the equation. Um, I, I don't have that figure for you right now. Okay. So the, I have a question, one of the, in the new structure, the bedroom number four is seven by eight, well, seven by almost nine. That seems incredibly small. I mean, you've got a bedroom that's a hundred and, how many square feet is that? Seven times eight is, 50. you've got a tiny bedroom. Seven times eight is 50. Bedroom number four in the new structure? Yeah, is, is that, am I reading this incorrectly? Bedroom number four, is that the old structure? Oh, I'm sorry, that's the old structure. I'm sorry, Mr. St. Hilaire, okay. I've read that wrong. That's facing, bedroom number four is seven by eight. On the second floor? Yes, that's that's the existing structure. That's the existing structure, I'm sorry, I misread that. Okay. It's still really small, but it's, it's <laughs> not one you're proposing. This is, I had a question for staff, but I, you can't answer this. Um, but one of the things I'd be interested in, Maureen, is the proposal here is to have a duplex, a non-owner occupied duplex on a 12,600 foot lot, 12,000 and a little bit. And it doesn't meet the requirements of um, zoning bylaw, which says you have to have an additional 2,500 feet for the uh, of area above the 12,000 square foot uh, minimum for a uh, one unit or one single family dwelling. If you add an additional duplex, additional unit, you got to have an additional 2,500 square feet. This doesn't provide that. This lot is not big enough for that. There's only it only exceeds the the bare minimum by 260 square feet. So it's substantially less than that. I'm interested in knowing how common that is in the neighborhood. Is there, are, is, can you look on from the, from the map and, and tell us if that occurrence is common in the neighborhood or if this is the first instance where you have a duplex that doesn't meet, is it 3.321? What is that um, requirement in the, the bylaw? Yeah, so uh, to answer your question, so let's see here. Uh, the lot size is 12,240 square feet. Yeah. And um, what would be required, is required for a, a two family unit would be uh, 14,500 square feet. The applicant is requesting a modification under footnote A. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, a reduction for the additional lot area for the second dwelling. Um, right. I don't have information about what the lot sizes are in the surrounding neighborhood, in the surrounding properties, but I could certainly provide that in preparation of the next meeting. The next meeting, would be some, I think we're gonna um, probably go to the next, the second meeting. At least I would recommend we do that, but um, that'd be good to have Maureen if we do go to a second meeting. 
Mr. St. Hilaire. I do have that information on a few of the abutting properties that I mentioned in the photos. Uh, 200 College Street, which is a duplex, is the same lot size, 12249. Uh, 175 College, which is also a duplex, is the same lot size, 12249. And 174 College, the four unit building, is only 18,500. So it is, uh, you know, all the lots along that street seemingly were laid out with the same area. And there are several duplexes on those lot sizes. Are they all non-owner occupied? They are. They're all pure rental properties. They are. So if we have a couple of them, Maureen, can you and also just take a look at the little broader neighborhood? That would sure. be great. Thank yep. you, Mr. Hilaire. That, that's helpful to know. Ms. Parks. I'm just going to say, I do have those uh, rolling trash cans, and I think they're about 45 inches tall, if um, uh, I'm pretty sure yeah. that's what, uh, what it was. Um, I also have a concern about the mail delivery. Um, so I'm just going to throw that out there that I'm not sure if you can move the mailboxes around to the side, but still, I'm not sure how mail was delivered there. I guess uh, someone walking that. Um, okay. Do, yep. do, they, do they just park on college and, and walk the mail to the door, Alan? Uh, I can answer that. I, I can't tell you where the vehicle is parked, uh, but we do manage several properties along this stretch of the road. And it is a foot carrier route. They, the mailboxes are all on the structure. They are not at the curb. So um, I believe what they do is they park and walk you know, between houses to a certain extent. So they would be walking across the front lawns from house to house, presumably because there's not a municipal sidewalk on this side of the street. It is it is grassy area right up to the curb with all the houses mm -hmm. along this side of the street. So um, if if we, as Mike alluded to, we eliminated that sidewalk simply to bring down the overall lot coverage and impermeable area, but if the concern uh, of the sidewalk remaining is more important to the board, we'd be more than happy to leave it. Uh, because we are asking for an expansion on an existing non-conforming use under 9.22, uh, I, I think that the impact to the overall lot coverage would be negligible. It's a, it's a two foot wide by 15 foot long sidewalk. So if that is, a concern, we'd be happy to update the site plan to include maintaining and not removing that sidewalk. Yeah, uh, 30 square feet. I, I, like I, parts. I was just wondering if you could put a path between the parking spaces and then put mailboxes there actually for delivery and mail if you wanted to remove the front uh, sidewalk, but you know, make a smaller, shorter sidewalk. Um, it like you know, it'd be four spaces on one side, four spaces on the other, something like that. But I, I don't know. Uh, maybe Maureen, you know, is that okay to move where you have your mail delivered? Can you put mailboxes on the side of a house? I don't know that answer. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, we could look, okay. we could look into it. And as Alan um, pointed out, um, you, this application, one of the applicable sections. Um, that is under review is a 9.22 and the lot currently exceeds the uh, maximum amount allowed for lot coverage and therefore um, they don't need to go um, go uh, they don't need to uh, reduce the amount of lot coverage um, they could maintain the lot coverage as existing or increase it um, because uh, oh. because this is being reviewed under 9.22 as a um, modification and, ex and um, expansion. I, I would just also note that uh, with the addition, having the mail delivered to a central part, uh, a central spot on the side would be more convenient for both, uh, yeah. you know, both dwellings instead of um, on the front of the house. Well, we'd certainly like to be able to check that then if, 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 if we're allowed to go over the existing coverage, but I have a hunch that we, we'd be very close to that 41.4 if we were to leave that walk-in, because Alan did, as Alan mentioned, it's pretty narrow as it is. 
Um, I don't, I don't think it's even three feet wide, maybe, but, um, you know, I, we could probably keep that coverage pretty close to the existing if we were to leave that in. I think Ms. Parks has an idea that might work. Take a look at it. And sure. if, we're, I think, if, we, if yep. we come back for a second meeting, you can provide an alternative for us or something we can look at it. There's some, there's some concerns raised here by the board and I think it'd be mm -hmm. worthwhile to try to think about it. Um, other questions, Ms. Parks? Anybody else? The question, a, a question I have often with um, rental property like this is, what are the, what are your expectations for the number of people that are going to reside in the in both units? Um, I know there's four bedrooms. What are your expectations for that, and how do you enforce that um, to make sure that the um, limits on four occupants per dwelling unit is complied with. I'd be happy to answer that, Mr. Chair. Uh, yep. The primary means of controlling the headcount is through the lease contract. And, um, you know, we do do occasional inspections. We also, uh, our maintenance staff gives us feedback when they're requested to come in and, and do maintenance. So we can remain aware of the number of occupants um, in a number of ways, but the primary means, which is the most enforceable for us is the lease contract, uh, which we provided a sample of. And our expectation is one person per bedroom. So four in unit one and four in unit two. So how often in your experience, and you have a lot of it in this town, managing um, property. In your experience, how frequent are your management personnel having eyes on those units to be able to determine whether there truly is four there and they're, and they're not uh, just, you know, people splitting up the bedroom uh, and there's more than four people uh, living there. It's not four, six or eight. Sure. How often do you actually do that from your experience? That give us some a, a feeling for how active your surveillance is. Sure. Yeah, I would say every couple of months, you know, perhaps six to eight times a year um, that we're in doing maintenance or on property, uh, you know, checking up, uh, make sure trash is in the proper location. And we, we every Monday we do drive by inspections to make sure that there are no issues. Uh, you know, we see a lot of properties that we don't have control over that have, uh, you know, tables and chairs in the front yard and they use them for the weekend and they stay there all week. And we, we, yeah pride our reputation in keeping our properties clean and well-maintained. And so every Monday we drive by these properties just to make sure the cars are in order. There's no litter everywhere. Uh, you know, we can't be there every day, of course, but once a week and we do it on Mondays because, you know, on the weekends is when there tends to be more activity. So we do drive-bys, exterior inspections every week. And I would say, you know, six to eight times a year internally. Um, we, of course, uh, by tenant landlord law and tenants rights have to give notice when we're going to go inside. Uh, but uh, we, those are the frequencies of inspections that we conduct. And, the, you know, the owners that we are, represent have a vested interest in not having excessive number of persons in the structure as well, because now we're talking about more wear and tear, more water sewer, more expenses to the owner. So it is of interest that we keep the head count down. Thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns from board members? Um, I'm just going to go through the project application report. I've marked things and I want to make sure I've got all my questions asked before we move on to public comments. I have no further questions at this time. Um, if the board members have no, no questions, is there any public comment? Uh, members of the public can comment now. I don't know if we have anybody who wishes to comment. Maureen. See here. I don't see anybody. No.
Well, um, I think maybe this is a point for the board to discuss the request from the uh, planning board about to postpone the our final decision on this and go to um, and continue the hearing until they have had a chance to get the um, presentation on the property. Um, I'd like to open that discussion up uh, now and, and uh, hear the opinion of any of any members. I stated my opinion, I think in comedy to a, a, another board of the town that has jurisdiction and frequently does look at things that's it with, you know, it would be um, considerate of us to provide that opportunity for the board. I know it's a, a disappointment or a delay for the applicant, but I think it's um, um, common decency to provide that opportunity for the board. And until it becomes a burden for us, I think it should be common for us to do that. But I'd like to hear from other members before we make a decision to continue this until a later date. Does anybody disagree? Good, okay. Then um, let's review, the, let's be clear on the things that we'd like to get from the applicant before the next meeting so that we don't have, we don't extend this and we can kind of have precise things that, that are um, of interest to us. And so for me, it was helpful to get your view on uh, the, your uh, census of some of the non-owner occupied duplexes in non-conforming properties in the area. Maureen, would you look at that just on the, within the block uh, and see how many others are there, if, if that's possible before the next meeting. You can build upon Mr. St. Hilaire's information. Um, I think it'd be helpful if you would look at some other way to, for people to access mail, particularly to access uh, the plot would be good. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, we should probably have conditions ready that imp require the um, performance of the conservation commission's um, con uh, conditions. I think that should be done. Um, I'd, I would like to see a, myself, I would like to see the plantings be amended or changed so that they actually screen the trash receptacles, whatever the height they are. <laughs> I, I, okay, I've noted that. Yep, something, up, something on that. Um, you had the detail of the Stockwood fence. Um, are there other conditions that people or other questions that people had that they want answered for the next meeting? Mr. Meadows, did you have anything? No? No, I, I would just like to know specifically about the fire department's opinion on access. All right. Well, that's a, that's a good point. We can ask um, Mr. Roy there, can't we, Maureen? Sorry, could you repeat that, Craig? For some reason, I couldn't hear you. Uh, I would like to know the fire department's opinion specifically on access to the building and in case of emergency. And that would both include fire trucks and ambulance because they do both, right. right? Okay. Sure. Mr. St. Hilaire, you had your hand raised for a second. Um, the question that I have for the board, uh, there was a, a, a bit of discussion around that front walkway. And if the lot coverage uh, does not exceed what is currently in place, and we were to keep that sidewalk, uh, does the board feel that that would be beneficial? In other words, you know, the, the site coverage that we have presently uh, is slightly more than what we are proposing. So if we do the calculations mm -hmm. and say that we can keep that front sidewalk and not go with an, any number that's uh, lot coverage number that's more than what is presently in place, uh, is that something that the board would uh, look upon favorably? I can't speak for everybody, but it seems to me that if you're not making the conditions worse in, in terms of exceeding the lot coverage limits, that would be a positive thing and providing more access. So one way to do that is that strip. It looks like it's about 45 square feet. If you're right, three feet times 15 feet long. That's not a lot of, of, um, of um, lot coverage. Another way is if you're looking at trying to do something in the center, where they have to walk up the driveway and you just, if you can create more space between the fourth and fifth car and move the parking 
area a little bit to the front, but you have a kind of a walkway between the fourth and fifth card that leads you up to the, the middle of the, the, uh, the unit, that's another possibility. But I, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I mean, I'm not concerned about if you're not exceeding the, if, if it's at or less than the current lot coverage, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I would be concerned if we exceed it. So I think that answers your question. And I don't think there's, I don't see any opposition or concern expressed otherwise by the board. Thank you. Ms. Parks. I'm just going to say, you, you might consider putting a little fence around the uh, trash receptacles. Um, so I'll just throw that out. I, it's, it's, I don't have a decision yeah. on yeah. that. I'm just saying it might be something to consider since it's hard to control uh, the height of plantings and whether they uh, survive well or not. Sure. And a stockard fence that matches the one you have on the side would be sure. simple to do. And it wouldn't have to be six feet high, you know, it could just be the four foot fence or whatever. Right. Yeah, good suggestion. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Parks. I was gonna say, and you could put mailboxes on it, but it's <laughs> 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 <That's> a possibility. <laughs> you better check with the post office on that. All right. Um, I think we've reached a consensus on what we want to do um, in terms of the uh, uh, continuing right. this for another date. You've got some assignments for you guys. We've mm -hmm. got some stuff that we have to do and the planning board wants to take a look at this. So now um, what I would like to do is move, I, I would entertain a motion that we continue the, pub, the public hearing. Uh, I oh. believe Michael Liu wanted to say something. Is that true? Oh. I think it's in relation to where you were going, Mr. Judge, um, about uh, scheduling the next hearing. I, I mean, are we... Are we guaranteed um, a, a spot on the June 16th planning board hearing at this time or? I, 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 I have no idea about that, but all I can do is, all I can do is say that we can post, we can um, skip. Okay. Skip, continue this for a date certain, which would be our next meeting after the planning board meeting at which I think they are going to have the presentation. And if it isn't, um, we can, can have a continuation again, but I think that um, I can't promise you the agenda from the planning board. Right, right. I understand. I just can't do that. So what I think we, the best thing we can do is, Maureen, is to have a, the um, continue this to the next meeting after June 16th, which is when we think the planning board will take this up. And I think that next one would be early July, because I know that I can't be at the 24th. Mm. Right? Yep. I don't know about the rest of the doodle poll, but the 24th, I will not be around. Uh, I think people are still kind of um, getting to uh, filling out that doodle poll. I don't know if that's complete. Um, so let's let me let me pull up. And if someone else doesn't mind pulling up a calendar, because sometimes I look at the wrong month. I got it. Uh, uh, it looks like the next uh, the the um, the second Thursday of July would be July eighth. July eighth, I think, is the next. Now let me yep. look at my work calendar in case um, some reason I have. Nope. Yep. That would um, that would work. Uh, I, okay. I, I hate to interrupt, but I should say that uh, my term expires at the end of June. Uh, and so I, if I don't know whether you could continue with only four of the people uh, who've been at uh, this hearing. Well, this might be the way to get you, we might, this might be the way to extend you uh, <laughs> against your will, I'll add. <laughs> if if but, he's agreeable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm but, kidding, but I'm sure we can get an extension or we can handle it with four if there's only four. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. We can handle it with four. That means it requires a unanimous consent. Uh, from the unanimous vote to do it, but we also could perhaps ask for, um, you know, an extension for a week for your term if you're if you're willing to go a little longer. Okay. We we could, but I, I'm just relieved to know discuss that that that, that, yes. there's a, that there's a way of continuing to, of the boards continuing to function uh, yep. e even even should my wisdom be absent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it. All right, so I'd entertain a motion. 
to uh, I think Dylan oh, had Dylan, one. Do you have something? I was just going to add on to that. I'm pretty sure um, it was covered in one of those VBA classes was uh, that members whose terms expires, but they're still actively working on a case are automatically uh, extended for continuation of that case. So sorry, Peter, it looks like you're, uh, you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There, there go my plane tickets. <laughs> no. Oh, no. No, no, no. We'll to, yeah, we might have to give you a, a remote access to oh, it. No. So from the south of France, you're going to have to call. Oh, right, right, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that meeting would start at, at that public hearing continuation would start at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. on July 8th. July 8th. Do I have a, July 8th. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved in a second. Second. All right. It's a roll call vote. Uh, any further discussion? I assume not. I vote aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Barrick? Aye. Great. The hearing is continued oh. until July 18th. Um, and did you, did you say July 8th or 18th? July 8th. July 8th. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Alan and Michael, I would suggest that you reach out to Chris I, Prestrup. Yep. Yep. We'll yep. do that. Great. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Good luck, you guys. And we'll look right. forward to getting material from you and, Great. and from Maureen before that. Again, we have, make sure you get it to us at least to Maureen's 10 days before the meeting date so that yes. we can process it and get it to all of everybody on the board. Good Thank memory. you very much. Thank you. All right, good night. Thank you. Um, next order of business is public comment on matters not before the board tonight. This is where the public can comment on anything except what we had before us tonight. And I don't see a hand raised. Okay. If none, what I'd like to do, I had one uh, new business that's not anticipated in the last 40 hours was the doodle poll and scheduling for the rest of the summer. Um, I'd ask you to, to fill out that doodle poll. Maybe you could resend it again, maybe sometime, Maureen, if people can't find it, which tries to lay out, which does attempt to uh, lay out your availability for the rest of the, the summer through, I guess it's through September. Um, Correct. And if you fill that out, then it helps us try to plan. I know I've, and we all have life to live other than ZBA. That's important. And that can't, and that can't dominate what you're gonna do this summer. But to the extent that ZBA and your life allow for full participation in our meetings, it's easier if we know when you're around. So please fill that out and get back to Maureen on that. That'll yeah, and, and also about the doodle poll is, um, it can be adjusted um, as the months go on. So if you say that you're available in August, but then suddenly you win free tickets to go to Paris, you could update the doodle poll and then bring yep. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else? Any matters that you guys wanna discuss? I do wanna say one thing, uh, Peter, you have had the best backgrounds um, of anybody. <laughs> um, the, the library at Mount Holyoke is truly a wonderful, wonderful oh, wow. building. And I love to see that. Um, it's really, that's when I first walked in there and saw that I thought, this is, this is just a gorgeous place. I don't know that I can study. I'd be looking up at the, at the architecture and the detail on that. And then the, the, the million dollar tree that you first had was something I really treasured, whatever that was, it was a butternut or something, but the million dollar tree on your background. So you've had great, great backgrounds. Thank you. And, and you, you get many points for, for recognizing that reading, which, well, which is indeed the, the, the handsomest space on the campus. <laughs> well, I, I, get, I better get some points because I paid an awful lot of money for my daughter to go there. So that's <laughs> I, 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 I hope she spent some time in the library. I hope so. <laughs> sure she did. Yes, yeah, she did. She did. All right, folks. If there's nothing else, um, I hope you all have a good week. We will uh, the uh, next Dylan, meeting win. 
Oh, Mr. D Mr. Maxfield. I just wanted to uh, put that out there. I mentioned before the meeting, as long as we're all going off topic here, I uh, I have finally graduated from UMass, so I am celebrating this Saturday. Uh, if any of you folks would like to come on out, um, I'm doing a, a barbecue, some pulled pork, and some ribs that I'm going to be smoking. Uh, if any of you folks are hungry, come on by, say hello, and uh, I'm, I don't think we're going to be violating open meeting here because I'm going to urge that nobody talk about the ZBA. I'm hosting guests. I don't want to record them. Maureen, can I send you uh, my address and you can you can send it out to everybody with that sure. word? Best way to do it. Cool. Sure. All right. Saturday at one o'clock, if you can swing by, I hope to uh, see some of you folks there. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Good work. Thanks. All right, well, that's it for me. Uh, I'll make the motion to adjourn. If, if we could just suspend oh. that for when's the next time we meet, Maureen? Uh, good question. 8, right? uh, June 10th. June 10th? Okay, June 10th. All right. All right, guys. Now the motion is good. You renews this motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. All in, it's non debatable. All in favor, you will say aye when I call your name. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. And Mr. Barrick. Aye. We are adjourned. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Or at Dylan's party. Or at Dylan's party, yes. <laughs> <laughs>